Welcome to Biohackers webinar. I'm your host Teemu Arina and today we will be diving deep into optimizing nutrition. If you have any questions about nutrition in your mind when it comes to optimizing your dietary intake of foods, nutrients, micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, um, your regimens of supplementation or foods or whatever, this webinar is for you. And if you have any questions, just jump into the chat on our YouTube chat. I will be happy to take any comments during this webinar. Today, we have Dr. Oli Soviarvi, and he will be giving a presentation about uh, optimizing nutrition. And this work is based on a book that we published recently. It's called The Biohackers nutrition guide and biker's nutrition guide if i can get it on the screen by the way is um, is 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 a book that has uh, all the fat soluble vitamins water soluble vitamins uh, minerals and micro elements fatty acids antioxidants amino acids and carbohydrates i know many of you have actually read this uh, guide. If you have not, you can get it from biohack.to slash nutrition guide. It's over 200 pages. It's the most cutting edge, the most comprehensive guide right now when it comes to nutrients. It's not a diet book. Um, when it comes to diets, like we are all different, but everyone, regardless of whatever your diet is, can optimize their nutrient intake. So understanding where you get the basic nutrients in your food, what is the best source for magnesium, for example, that most people are deficient of, or let's say selenium. Do you fully understand what selenium does on the body? Uh, like this book will also give you a brief overview of the different nutrients and their role in the body and the sources in terms of foods where you can get them. And based on all this information you can take this and optimize whatever diet you have if you're a vegan if you're a carnivore if you're omnivore whatever you can actually always increase your understanding of what you're eating and what are the best sources and then optimize them and one really key thing when it comes to optimizing your nutrition intake is of course laboratory testing so that you understand what you're actually deficient in and you're correcting the right things I think that's like one of the basic kind of insurance policies for anyone. And if you've been following all these longevity experts, they all recommend you for longevity that you address nutritional deficiencies because it's kind of like you're building, let's say, an apartment for yourself. And you have different ingredients that you need to build that apartment. Let's say you need bricks and you need some clay and you need some nails and you need all kinds of things. And if you're building a wall, and the clay is not yet there. Uh, you know, the bricks will just stay there and no one's gonna build the wall until the clay arrives. And nutrients are kind of the same on the body. If you don't have enough of the right nutrients, it's not gonna run optimally. And that's why this is like one of the basic things you should start from. So we will definitely dive into all the details that you should know. And when it comes to really like taking your journey in terms of optimizing your nutrition, one of the most important insurances you can probably have in your life is, is actually to sign up for the Optimize Your Nutrition online course. There's all kinds of online courses online, but this course particularly is one of the most comprehensive, the most evidence-based and, and, evidence and quality um, uh, course available on the market today based on 260 pages of top advice on nutrition, vitamins, well, vitamins, minerals, and other micronutrients. It has high quality video lectures, each one, everything from 30 minutes to an hour, seven lectures in total by Dr. Oli Soviarvi. So today's webinar is just like a tip of the iceberg of what is possible. It has plenty of additional material. It's all based on scientific references, but it's super easy to understand for anyone. Uh, wherever you come from, if you're like a, you know, nutrition, sports and nutrition, um, nutrition expert, uh, biohacker, or you're just like a layman who wants to understand a little bit more about the nutrition side of things. Like these courses for all of you, everyone will get new insights from from this particular course. And uh, one one thing that I wanted to say about uh, this course is that you know the optimize your nutrition course. It's it's so comprehensive. It's it's cutting edge. Uh, 
it focuses really on building this personalized and nutrient optimized diet for yourself uh like understanding where you come from where you're right now and, and taking the right steps and your guide will be dr oli soviarvi he's a functional medicine doctor he covers topics such as nutritional factors their effects on the body and well-being best food sources uh, for these nutrients measuring these nutrient levels in the body choosing high quality products and and uh, you know also in the way like how you can save maybe even in food costs when you are thinking about getting these nutrients it's six weeks long it includes weekly lectures extensive text material supplement recommendations uh, it's an it's on an online platform an online environment you can access through any device and on that platform dr olis obviously will be also answering your questions uh, so whatever you have in your mind uh, is going to be there so i think this is uh, like a complete steal a bargain like at this this price point of of 65 67 euros to to get on this course and you can actually buy also the biker's nutrition uh, guide book uh, alongside with the course if you want so you just uh, go to biohack.to slash optimized nutrition and you get full access but um that's all for now i want to invite dr oli Soviarvi into studio he has a comprehensive presentation about optimizing your nutrition that he's going to cover and you have the opportunity to ask questions from him so i will be following the chat so whatever questions you have, I will be uh, uh, like having moments with Oli when I will be uh, posing your questions to him. So right now I see already people coming into the chat. So welcome Anel and Philippe and Jennifer. Welcome, welcome. Um, there's already questions about proper lab measurements. Uh, yeah, we're going to cover this in, in this um, webinar and also in the course uh, you get, you know, and also in the guide, there is a lot about the lab. So if you ever like wondered how to decipher, decrypt like, you know, lab work and what should you do and check what is the best uh, way even to measure something, this is for you, so for sure. And uh, yeah, there is already a question about vitamin K2 and which might be better than, uh, which might be better MK, MK4 or MK7. So Oli will keep those in mind when he's giving the presentation. So we'll answer all these. So whatever questions you have, like, please, please let us know. Uh, and uh, yeah, like without further ado, like uh, welcome Oli to the show. Hey, thanks, man. And uh, it's great to be here for this webinar. It's a bit different than our previous ones. So this is uh, more of a lecture style. So I will cover a lot of the stuff that we have in the course but that's still maybe like one sixth one seventh of the course material because it's simply so exhaustive and um, yeah uh, let's let's do it like this that i will have a presentation i will go through like the three first sections or weeks of the course and the materials and um, i'm sure you have a lot of questions but uh, i'm pretty sure i'm actually also be being ab uh, able to answer your questions in the presentation itself, for example, for that K2. Uh, I would like to remind you that uh, if you go to the bikercenter.com, we have especially all and only for this webinar, uh, minus 10% using the code top nutrition. So different kind of supplements, books and courses, but it's, it's available only during this webinar and maybe a little after that. But yeah, use the code top nutrition. Indeed, indeed. That's the code, 10% <laughs> off. And also, uh, we have some laboratory tests as well that you can order at home. Uh, those are at discount already on the store, 7% uh, discount, for example, for several of these. The metabolomics test is the one that we do recommend. We have some things for adrenals, and there's also things for the gut, for example. Oli is a top specialist on gut health as well. We actually do have Optimize Your Gut course as well. So while you're picking up the Optimize Your Nutrition course, you may want to also take a look at the Optimize Your Gut course. This course is brand new, but it's based on years of work. Like we have actually already had 6,000 people going through this course in Finland, in Finnish language. And now we are making it available for our international audience. And we're very, very excited about that. Indeed, yeah, yeah this, this has been 
uh, in the process for a while and I'm pretty pretty stoked to be <laughs> like mildly put uh, about releasing this so this is actually going live tomorrow so uh, you have uh, the perfect time to join the course but hey let's go to the lecture let's go and uh, I have a slideshow for you guys so Floor is yours. a lot of thank you a lot of information about to come what's inside of the course uh, just a quick quick view of that it's six weeks in week one and there's fat soluble vitamin vitamins week two uh, water soluble vitamins week three all kinds of minerals micro elements week four it's fatty acids week five oxidative stress and antioxidants like all of the best ones and week six finally amino acids and carbohydrates first um if you want to get like an optimal nutritional state, you would want like the best absorption uh, possible. And uh, of course, uh, most of the nutrients are absorbed from the small intestine and a little bit in also in the largest intestine. But you wouldn't want to uh, aim for the optimal intake, which is uh, your current optimal nutrient intake that helps you to stay in the best possible health. And here, of course, measuring different kind of uh, lab markers regarding nutrition. For example, in Finland, we have this uh, wide spectrum nutritional package uh, that uh, I think we're going to be able to provide you guys this uh, with Biostarks. But uh, before that, um, I will actually come to this. I would recommend you take this uh, Metabolomics Plus test. So this one is something I would recommend if you want to actually know your uh, functional need. This is not per se measuring the exact amount in the blood, but, but this is actually going even further. It's measuring what you functionally need. So for example, if, you're, if your intake for, let's say, vitamin A is increased or vitamin C or whatnot. And it's also measuring all kinds of things regarding your energy metabolism, uh, different kind of uh, neurotransmitters, even gut health markers. So this is a very uh, wide spectrum test that I would recommend you take. And you can use the code top nutrition here if you want to actually gain this advantage. So um, yeah, in the course uh, for every possible nutrient, I have a different kind of lab tests, different reference ranges, and also possible optimal ranges if they they are have been like um, in the science literature being um, recommended or uh, validated so here is like the standard curve standard deviations and you would want to at least be in the reference range like the one sigma to minus one sigma to plus one sigma even uh, aim for the often considered optimal levels and uh, if you have like, let's say, subclinical low levels, then uh, you should all like already do something about it. But yeah, um, fat soluble vitamins. I'm not going to go through all the materials I have in the course because uh, we would be here still like t tomorrow. But uh, I would want to give you like the basics of all of it that's inside the course. So of course, vitamin D, that's the most important fat soluble vitamin and it has uh, so wide impact on the whole body so it's basically a pro hormone it's it's like a hormonal like substance and uh, you get it I, I know this is uh, probably something you already know but uh, the UVB rays from the sun you get it from there and the liver is making that and it's going to the kidneys to like change it to the active form like the calcitriol and then we have vitamin D receptors like all over the cells so those receptors need to function like properly. Of course, you can get it uh, a little bit uh, from the nutrition, but the form is usually vitamin D2 when, when it's actually what you need is vitamin D3 and uh, the calcitriol form of it. But the research is very exhaustive, like preventive difficult diseases. Uh, you know, you have the list over there. I'm not going to go through all of these, but basically that's kind of like a, the most important vitamin there is and yeah let's uh, go through some kind of some factors that increase the absorption and the concentration of vitamin d because it's not usually enough that you take vitamin d because there are some so many 
uh, things that could go wrong. Like you could be genetically, you would need more. And if you're not measuring it, how do you know how much you need? Uh, what about the other cofactors that you actually need there? But uh, as a reminder, the UV radiation in the midday sun, you only need about 15 to 20 minutes to get like a proper load of vitamin D synthesis in the body. Of course, you don't want to burn yourself. You don't want to overdo it, but that's, that's uh, the best way to get vitamin D. And, uh, but you also need adequate vitamin A intake and its concentration in the blood. So these kind of uh, two vitamins, they kind of... Uh, or function hand in hand. If you have a low vitamin A, you first want to fix that. Then these long chain omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, they increase the amount of vitamin D receptor and promote their function. So up amping up the intake of, of omega-3 fatty acids, the long chain ones, also will help vitamin D function in the body and especially get into the cells. Also, you need magnesium, so if you have suboptimal levels of magnesium, you want to fix that to make the vitamin D more into the active form. And it's also helping to transport the vitamin D in the body. What about optimal levels? I haven't seen any like official recommendations for optimal levels, but I have seen some studies, for example, this one, which states optimal vitamin D supplementation levels for cardiovascular disease protection so this is um it's a huge thing because uh, that's one of the leading causes of death uh, in the whole world so uh, the basic recommendations i'm actually like i'm not putting these into nan nanograms per deciliter but the, i use these uh, european standard uh, <laughs> units called nanomoles per liter but if you like divide that with uh, 2.5 then you get these nanograms per deciliter uh, values or something like that, but uh, you want you would want to aim for over 100 or something between 100 and 150. So that's uh, the optimal concentration, at least based on this study, to prevent cardiovascular uh, disease. So I, when I measure my vitamin D levels, I definitely want to aim for that. And for me, for example, it means that I should take at least 100 micrograms of vitamin D per day to actually get into this optimal level. If I like um, don't take it at all, it usually drops, but I want to keep it there. And of course, in the, in the summer, I like to have a lot of sun, sun into my body. So then I usually like um, don't take that much vitamin D. But yeah, that's also highly individual. So definitely recommend, um, I recommend measuring vitamin D in the blood. And um, yeah, always combined vitamin D with vitamin K2. So if you want to have like a real uh, bone health uh, effects of the vitamin, tree, uh, vitamin D3, you need vitamin K2. It's helping the calcium absorption, bone resorption and calcium reabsorption. And uh, yeah, top foods. There is also a question about whether you won't want to have MK7 form of, of K2 or MK4, both. <laughs> both are um, highly needed and uh, the best sources are here like natto, goose liver, pretty exotic one, hard cheeses on average have a um, nice amount of, and even egg, egg yolks. And um, here are the effects that uh, what MK2 has for bones and blood vessels, both are highly important. So this is kind of like directing calcium inside the body. You, don't, you definitely do not want calcium in your arteries or like the blood vessels you want into the bone. So MK7 is especially needed for the formation of, of osteocalcin, which is a hormone and improving bone regeneration and in general like the energy production. And the intake of MK4 and MK7 should be at least 50 micrograms per day. And this effectively prevents the calcification of blood vessels. But I, I don't think that's enough for optimal bone health. So you should aim at least for 200 micrograms per day. And uh, yeah, the best sources, hard, long ribbon cheeses, tempeh, natto and egg yolk. 
So if you're not getting any of these in your diet, you definitely would want to consider taking a vitamin K2 supplement. And in the course, I'm definitely going to go deeper than this into this uh, particular subject. So vitamin K2 is highly fascinating fat-soluble vitamin. Some people mix vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. Vitamin K1 is especially needed for like blood clotting and uh, like preventing blood clots, but it's, it's actually also needed for bone formation. So you need also a little bit of vitamin K2, but uh, I mean vitamin K1. And the sources are uh, totally different. Vitamin K is mostly abundant in leaf greens, and as we have gone through, the, the MK4, MK7, and there's also like other forms of vitamin K2, like MK9, and they are usually found in fermented foods. But if you do not tolerate fermented foods, let's say you have, uh, have like histamine intolerance, then you might just want to consider having a good supplement of uh, vitamin K2. And Regarding supplementation, I will also go through the best possible supplements, in my opinion, and based on my research and the quality of the products in the specific module for each week uh, inside the course. Then we have vitamin A. As I mentioned, it's uh, highly um, critical to have also good levels of vitamin A. You don't want to have too much of it because it might be like liver toxic, but usually if you if you balance vitamin D and A, it, it's never a problem. And of course, we can get it from animal sources like liver, and say it's in a different form, and uh, vegetable sources like uh, in carrots, it's carrot and beta carotene form, and that's actually, that's called like um, stored in the liver. And the retinol is kind of like the active form of the vitamin A, and then we have like different forms uh, in the downstream of, of the metabolism like retinol, retinoic acid and then the elimination. But as you can see from the other image on the right, it uh, has some multiple effects like systemic effects, effects throughout the body, important for thyroid, the pancreas, bone formation, different cellular receptors, skin health, a big one, definitely also very much needed for the immune system but also for the HPA axis, which is like the stress uh, controlling as axis. So you need vitamin A, I would say, all over the body. So make sure you get enough of vitamin A. And of course, you should always measure the levels. Then let's uh, jump into the water soluble vitamins. So in the like halfway of my presentation, we will have questions, so if you have questions now, just put put it there in the webinar chat and we will go through them with Demo Arena. What are some your vitamins? It's of course vitamin C and all of the B complex vitamins. I, I think vitamin C is something like everybody knows and hey, maybe you should take vitamin C and it's, it's probably the most used supplement in the world. That, that's like my estimate. I haven't like checked. Maybe I should ask ChatGPT, hey, what is the most common or most used supplement? Let's see if, you, if we have vitamin C there. But uh, it has a lot of different kind of effects in the body. And uh, like the antioxidant effect, it's of course one of the most important ones, especially intracellular. So it's preventing oxidation of fatty acids. And uh, also like different kind of effects in the absorption of different vitamin B vitamins. But the most important effects should be, or I, I would call them like, the, which are collagen synthesis, uh, connective tissue support, like bones, tendons, joints, and uh, other tissues. And um, if you have like a deficiency, which is extremely rare, but you know, during these times, it's interesting that somewhere in the world, actually the scurvy, which is like the lack of vitamin C, it's uh, popping up again. So this is uh, pretty disturbing to me that you are not getting vitamin C enough, which is literally all over the place. And uh, scurvy was actually used to tr be treated um, in the salesmen by eating raw onions. So there's uh, vitamin C also in onions. Yeah, um, I'm not going to go through like 
all the possible things here in the course I will <laughs> like dive really deep in this but uh, this is something that people are always ask hey is there like difference in the supplemental forms of vitamin C and yeah it's it's you know uh, all of this work ascorbic acid which is like the basic synthetic form really cheap it works like half-life about three three to four hours so if you take it multiple times per day you might have like good concentrations in the blood if, if that's what you need then we have like sodium calcium ascorbate and ascorbic acid plus bioflavonoids that's um, maybe a little bit better one then we have like ester c that's containing cal- calcium ascorbate and dehydroascorbate that's usually if you have some uh, gut issues taking ascorbic acid so ester c might be helpful and then it's my uh, favorite which is liposomal vitamin c very highly absorbable form of vitamin c and it's actually improving the intracellular levels of vitamin c and it's it's usually also like um, absorbing slowly or raising the levels in the blood more uh, in a constant way then we have a fat soluble form and uh, that's called ascorbyl palmitate so all of this work it depends on the situation what you want to do about it and uh, in the course i will go of course uh, through all these questions best food sources for vitamin c so in the course you will get these kind of lists for every possible vitamin mineral fatty acid you name it i've kind of duck uh, every possible nutrient that that has the best um, density of different kind of uh, nutrients so this is a i know this is like a, the amylaberry extract it's a it's a, it's a very rare like form and it's, it's highly 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 concentrated so you wouldn't have like this uh, in in like uh, the regular amylaberry which has maybe like uh I don't know, 600 milligrams per 100 grams, but this is like <laughs> whole, totally a different one. Like one teaspoon contains one 2,500 milligrams of vitamin C. But, you know, this is an outlier. So uh, Kamu Kabu, really good one, and uh, parsley, paprika, common nettle, horseradish, seaberry, blackcurrant, broccoli. So where is orange? Usually people say, hey, drink orange juice and you get a lot of vitamin C. Well, uh, not really. Yeah, there's some vitamin C, but there's more sugar than vitamin C. So uh, definitely at least do not go crazy with um, orange juice to get your daily dose of vitamin C. Maybe like a better uh, forms or better sources of vitamin C would be uh, recommended. Then we have uh, B vitamins, and in this webinar I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, I'm going to go through like the basic functions of B vitamins. There's uh, of course like thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, pathogenic acid, pyridoxin, folate, biotin, cobalamin. And these are all needed in the body, they are essential, they are water soluble, except for vitamin B12, we have a storage in the liver, and it might actually last something uh, like as much as 20 to 30 years even so if you're getting if you have if you're deficient in vitamin b12 that's not something that's been like developing lately it's it's been in the years of developing uh, this that's this kind of uh, deficiency but um, each yeah each b vitamin has certain impact on the human body but all B vitamins interact with each other in certain ways. So that's maybe like if you take B vitamins, taking a, a bioavailable B complex could be like a good idea. But if you have like certain deficiencies, let's say like uh, you're deficient in thiamine, then of course supplementing with only that would be wise. But if you're not measuring the levels, then it might be hard to know hey, if I'm getting like enough of this or I, am I getting like too much of this? In many supplements, the amounts are really high and those may not be useful. They, they may be useful if you're, if you're like highly stressed, you have some kind of disease 
and the need for B complex vitamins is highly increased, then having like huge amounts of, of those uh, might be beneficial. Uh, all B vitamins take part in the cellular energy production and they also act as antioxidants and participate in the formation of red blood cells ensure normal functioning of the nervous system. So this is usually something people, um, hey, I take B vitamins uh, because my nervous system is uh, whacked or I'm highly stressed. That uh, may be a wise idea, actually. And uh, other um, functions are methylation, estrogen, metabolism, and so on. And the best sources are organ meats, uh, chicken eggs, red meat, nutritional yeast, if you're like vegetarian or vegan, then like dark green vegetables and herbs, uh, a good source for folate, uh, legumes, avocado, and of course seafood. Let's have a zip of this uh, shinsol drink. <laughs> I'm just gonna give here an example. So in the course, and especially on the lectures on, on these water-soluble vitamins, it's almost an hour le lecture and I will go in a nitty-gritty detail through every possible nutrient. But here's an example, like folate. Uh, I, I like folate, it's, it's a very <laughs> important one. And uh, I want people to know that, hey, if you're taking folic acid, that might not do anything good for you. Like you might be in the need for actually the bioavailable, bioactive form, which is folate, because you could have like MTHFR gene mutation, which is uh, pretty common. Maybe like 35% have like the heterozygote mutation and uh, actually it's 60% and 35% have like the homozygote. So they have like both alleles in the gene. So their need, they, they actually could get worse with folic acid. So I always recommend going for the bioavailable form, which is in this case, case like methyl folate or, or something like bioactive folate. Uh, this has a lot of uh, different effects in the body, like nucleic acid precursors, um, several amino acid methylation reactions. The methylation is probably like one of the most important ones, and folate participates in this kind of uh, one carbon metabolism. So you can see in the image that it's also very important in if you have elevated homocysteine levels uh, to lower those ones. And uh, in the babies, uh, essential for normal, normal growth, and especially the brain development, the neural tube development. Uh, so that's why uh, pregnant women, they should take folate, not folic acid in my opinion, but fo go for folate. And um, the best way to ensure like your uh, optimal levels is to measure that one. Severe folate deficiency causes this uh, thing called megaloplastic anemia. So um, you don't want to be deficient of, of that. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the best food sources for folate are um, actually it's um, yeah leaf greens if we check the slides, um, but also different livers. So liver is it's kind of if you eat animal foods, it's it's a nature's multi nutrient. Um, you could take like eat liver let's say once a week or take uh, highly high quality liver capsules, but also you you manage at least uh, in the folate part, with just using like these leaf greens, dark green leaf greens, uh, parsley, common nettle, uh, spinach. Um, you would want to, you don't want to eat too much raw spinach because of oxalate risk, but uh, if you like cook it a little bit, then it usually goes uh, at least to a minimal amount. And uh, if you're not, um, taking or getting enough folate, there may, might be some kind of reasons. Uh, it might not be absorbed or your uh, the need for folate is increased. Uh, if you're using a lot of alcohol, smoking tobaccos, cigarettes, uh, if you have celiac disease, IBD, or if you have high homocysteine levels, so, so usually the old folate is used to actually metabolize that. So the body is really wide. It uses the things it has available, but if it doesn't have available, then you know, that's a problem. Next, uh, 
before the question break, we go to the week three, which is minerals and micro elements. This is also a huge, huge, huge week, huge chapter. So as you can see, there's a lot of material going in the first few weeks um, in the form of videos, lectures, and but also in the written form in the course platform. Um, a lot of different minerals. I'm definitely not going to go through all of these. And in the course, uh, I will cover the most important ones, like the primary minerals, which are maybe like a, a bigger in size, so that you could call these like macro minerals, even calcium, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and sodium chloride. And then we have secondary minerals, which are iron, zinc, manganese, molybdenum, selenium, iodine, chromium, copper, silicon, and boron. A lot of stuff there, and they're all very critical for the human body. We need all of these, and uh, optimal amounts, of course, would be like the best one. And again, measuring these ones, I've uh, measured a couple of times, and maybe like five times I've done the, the exhaustive uh, nutrition panel. And I, For example, I noticed that if I'm not supplementing with selenium, I'm not getting into the optimal amounts. And the same thing goes for manganese, at least in my my case. So then I began like checking, hey, maybe I'm not getting these foods, hiring manganese, and that's actually the case. And also selenium, I don't like Brazil nuts that much, which is uh, the best source for selenium. So I supplemented here and, here and there. And uh, copper was also the other one that... Uh, I supplement every now and then. But for example, for copper, you can get it easily from, uh, let's say, if you like cashew nuts, you don't want to go crazy about this. And But also dark chocolate, high high levels of copper in those, uh, on that. And of course, liver, very high in copper. But yeah, I will go to through two of the most important ones, in my opinion, which, is, which are calcium and magnesium. And uh, there's a lot of calcium in the body, like almost one kilogram of calcium, and the most of them is uh, or are in the bones and the teeth. And it's very difficult to get an overdose from food, but uh, if you take a lot of calcium supplements, then it's possible, totally possible to get too much calcium, and especially if you're not getting enough magnesium and enough K vitamin K2, so the calcium actually could cause some problems, even like predisposing to cardiovascular disease. So beware not using too much of the calcium supplements, or if you are, always supplement with magnesium and uh, vitamin K2 and vitamin D. <laughs> uh, if you are deficient in the calcium, it, you are predisposed to osteopenia, and uh, if, it, if it's going on and on, uh, then the osteoporosis, which is actually a d disease, it's, it's, it's a bone disease. But you also might get blood clotting disorders, fatigue, hypertension, even type, type 2 diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, and arrhythmias. So, very important one there. And uh, this is an interesting one. Adequate potassium intake, together with calcium, reduces calcium excretion into the urine, and therefore can improve the utilization of calcium in the body. So having enough potassium from the diet, also very important for the physiological effects of calcium in the body. Remember that one. Um, how do you measure calcium, like the nutritional intake? Well, well the thing is that you, you really don't. <laughs> the calcium levels in the blood, they tell almost nothing about the body's calcium reserves, and because they're in the bones. For this purpose, especially when getting older, I would recommend uh, to do this kind of a DXA scan to measure the bone density. So there you can actually see if, if you have a good bone density. Usually it means, hey, maybe you have enough calcium. Usually that's the case. And about the supplements, calcium carbonate, that's like very common. Uh, it has like 40% of the calcium element itself. And uh, it's, it's okay in, in the absorption, maybe 27% absorption rate. And uh, if you take calcium supplements, you should be taking it with uh, food or shortly after it to maximize the absorption. And as a reminder, again, take calcium always with vitamin D and vitamin K2. 
Best food sources? Should you drink liters of milk per day? Definitely not. <laughs> you might actually cause some problems, and this we cover in the course. Is milk bad for you? I'm not sure it, it here, except for the answer is probably yes. And it's not about lactose, but uh, many other things. And it's not even the best source of calcium. And uh, the better sources are, if you tolerate these like hard cheeses, you almost get a, a thousand milligrams per hundred grams. So that's uh, hands down one of the best sources or the best source for calcium there is. And um, we have CV, dried kombu, um, whey protein, really good source. Um, again, nettle, sardines, uh, some other fish, fish in general, pretty good source for calcium. Uh, goat, goat cheese, almonds, and windus. And uh, yeah, different kind of factors pred predispose to calcium deficiency. Of course, if you have a low calcium diet, if you're deficient in vitamin D, magnesium, you're alcoholic, you're going through menopause, that's uh, also something to be taken into consideration. And uh, certain drugs, uh, I would uh, highlight here corticosteroids. So they usually cause a lot of problems in the bones and also in the calcium metabolism. And this is something interesting one. Um, this research paper from 2012, Essential Nutrients for Bone Health, a review of the, their availability, blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, uh, this is a good list uh, to add into the things I mentioned before, like vitamin D, calcium, magnesium, vitamin D2. We have also silicone, especially like for teeth and bone. Boron, really important micromineral. Vitamin C, copper, zinc, and manganese. So these all actually function hand in hand. And here is a really nice uh, preferred supplementation. Of course, this is like the author's, author's opinion about this. But um, I think it's pretty good. Like uh, if you would like want to supplement, you would like want to go around something like this. Of course, getting from the diet, always better. But let's say you take a multivitamin and you have some bone problems you might check, want to check this uh, uh, table. Then we have magnesium. Like this, I would say this is my favorite mineral because uh, there's, there's so many things that magnesium does. And it has helped me a lot, like in terms of recovery, sports performance, like brain health, energy metabolism, and so on, and so on, and so on. But it's basically... Um, participating in over 300 enzymatic reactions, it's coenzymes, and uh, it's all over the place. And if, if you take too much calcium, it might actually cause magnesium deficiency. So the balancing the calcium and magnesium intake, it's, it's uh, highly beneficial. Uh, the optimal intake has been found in several studies to be one of the most important factors in preventing coronary, coronary artery disease. So that's a really big one. So that this is um, something you definitely want to take enough. And the calcium-magnesium ratio from the food and supplements uh, included in total should be around 2 to 1. So a little, little bit more calcium than magnesium, maybe around double or a little less. Uh, magnesium deficiency then again can predispose to calcium deficiency. And uh, if you take a different kind of research, estimates, uh, the optimal intake for magnesium is uh, anything between 6 to 10 milligrams per kilogram per day. So let's, let's say you're an athlete, you weigh 100 kilos, you, you actually might want to get 1,000 milligrams of, of magnesium per day. This is not to say that you should take all of this from supplements, of course, like getting it from food, it's um, also very important, but uh, you might want to aim for that, at least for 6 milligrams per, per kilogram per day. And the mild deficiency of magnesium has increased significantly during the last decades. So this is something that's bubbling under there. People are not getting enough magnesium. So supplementation, that this would be one of my go-to supplements, so like uh, besides vitamin D, magnesium would be the other one. 
and they will also work hand in hand. Too little intake of magnesium linked to vitamin D deficiency and because the magnesium promotes the synthesis of vitamin D from sunlight in the skin. Best foods. Um, many people say, hey, I don't know actually which foods contain magnesium. And it's, it's, uh, many of the foods are nuts, seeds, but of course there's dark chocolate. It's also kind of like nuts, cocoa, nuts or cacao, cocoa, how you want to spell it or pronounce it. Uh, we have hemp seeds. Uh, Brazil nuts, almonds, pine nuts, oat bran. And uh, from animal uh, side, we have uh, salmon and roast beef. So there is magnesium, at least a little bit in, in animal products. But um, if you're not eating a ton of nuts and seeds, which I would not recommend doing, like maybe a handful a day ma- at maximum. So in, in like this regard, you should probably supplement or at least measure like the optimal levels on your side for the magnesium. And if you're having any of these like things, IBD, celiac disease, you're having like uh, chronic diarrhea or diabetes, or if you're like uh, an alcoholist, chronic alcoholism, or if you're just aging and you're not eating a like nutrient dense diet, or if you're an athlete and doing like a lot of sports, then the intake for magnesium is uh, definitely increased. So yeah, let's uh, <laughs> now take a little break with Temu. Yeah, let's go with questions. Hopefully, hopefully you haven't slept in there. This yeah, is quite a bit. <laughs> super interesting. The chat is on fire. There's a lot of questions <laughs> coming in. Oh my God. Uh, let me let me like address now the question about chocolate. So Donnie is asking, what chocolate. is the difference between chocolate, cacao, and cocoa? I can maybe explain this and yeah, give the that, reader. Yeah. So that basically these terms are different um, stages in the production of uh, chocolate. So cacao refers to the actual raw seed uh, or the bean. It's the Theo, Theobroma cacao, the food of the gods, Theobroma from, from God, which they harvest uh, the cacao pods and that then they maybe ferment or dry or roast the, the beans. And that is then used to make like these different cocoa products. So cocoa is generally referred to the processed form of uh, of cacao beans, maybe for example, to extract the fat, which is the, the, the cacao butter, and the resulting dry powder is usually called cocoa powder. And then we take that and we turn that into chocolate. And the finished product could be anything from dark chocolate to flavored ones. And definitely if you get your chocolate, raw chocolate is probably one of the best things to go for. It's actually very high in magnesium, calcium, like all these minerals, all I was talking copper. about. Copper. Yeah, copper also. Yeah, copper. Yeah. Really nice explanation. Couldn't have done it better. <laughs> yeah, here you go. So um, let's let's continue with Donny. So um, there's a question about like, th- let's cover some basics first. Mm. For example, what is the healthiest cooking oil in your opinion? Rapid fire answers. Yeah, extra virgin olive oil for sure, but do not like uh, overheat it but it actually it's uh up to 190 celsius why why are celsius. animal fats like more resistant to oxidization when you heat them Do well it's know? saturated of course you can use that but if, if you ask for the healthiest one then uh, this would be the choice i use ghee like clarified uh, traditional method uh, used uh, butter and uh, like olive oil not not so much anymore coconut oil, which is also pretty stable, or just lard, <laughs> like uh, any saturated fat. But if you use like butter, you get this Maillard reaction there if you're like burning. Yeah, the brown butter. So, so the ghee, butter. yeah, ghee is better. Yeah, I actually combine extra virgin olive oil and ghee. Same, and I yeah, also yeah. use spices, and I recommend you also to use spices like thyme or rosemary. And the polyphenols from those herbs will actually... Uh, protect the fat also from oxidization and and that's why you should invest in high quality olive oil which is a little bit green even so you see that the polyphenols mm-hmm. the protective agents are there now the next question is about what is the healthiest sweetener oh my god i hate sweeteners <laughs> well i i would say probably in terms of like science, science. if you ask if you ask uh, dr huberman science uh, stevia like uh, stevia leaves 
uh, traditional stevia leaves. That, but maybe you like monk fruit. But where where you get that? At least it's not here. Um, I like so, so I like so coconut. Not, not raw extracted stevia, yeah. but the leaves with the other yeah. nutrients in it, right? Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. I, indeed. Uh, otherwise, I, I I don't like stevia at all. Yeah. I like yeah. like coconut palm sugar. Yeah, yeah. Donny says that. Uh, he, he or she uses uh, organic raw honey and um, I actually like to combine one. I like yeah. to put a little bit of a real sweetener if I use like things like stevia yeah. it, like try it out like the metallic taste is gone if you just put a little bit of the real thing I, I also like xylitol myself that's pretty nice for <laughs> for <fartitol>. all <laughs> yeah gum health and all that yeah um, you... <laughs> yeah, sugar alcohols have this link to gut bacteria that is not very fully uh, not yet fully understood but there might be mm. some disturbances of using sugar alcohols like erythriol or or stuff like that i i don't like erythritol at all and it's, uh yeah i don't think that's a good one like uh, yeah. you would want to search for something else so that's that's probably why stevia is used all over the place but you can get like good good-ish stevia and uh, very bad stevia so uh... so another thing that probably a lot of people think about is about the supplements or captain commodore is asking whether we have to cycle supplements i already gave in the chat mm. like a recommendation with l-dopa containing like mucuna pruriens for example velvet bean to cycle them in and out because and and it also includes other things that can this disrupt uh, hormones or neurotransmitters. Uh, L-dopa, of course, with dopamine, but then if you take mukuna, yeah, that's mm. L-dopa. But if you take maca, for example, that can also have an effect on the hormones. You're not necessarily getting the results you want. So that's just to reset the situation. That's why you want to cycle things in and out, just like with coffee. What do you think? Yeah, um, depends on the nutrient. Of course, if you are like deficient in certain essential nutrients you don't want to cycle them but if you're just using for in this case let's say like a neutrop for neutropic effects or boosting certain like neurotransmitters it's it's a totally different thing so uh, supplement is not a supplement so <laughs> there are different different kind of supplementations it's depending if you're like um, supplementing for a lack of nutrients that you are not getting enough or you are trying to achieve some kind of like mental state or uh, physical state. So that's that's different. Uh. Yeah. Let's take a few specific questions about vitamins and minerals. So Khaled Hegley is asking how to prevent calcification with vitamin D intake. Now it's good to kind of balance vitamin D to intake with other nutrients like vitamin K2 and magnesium, which are known to be synergistic with yeah. vitamin D to regulate calcium metabolism. Do you have anything to add on that one? Not really. I think I went through that like pretty exhaustively in, in the presentation yeah, like right. here. So, well, as yeah. a reminder, yeah, vitamin K2, magnesium, vitamin A, a lot of like this. When you have a lot of like enough of these, you are usually mm -hmm. safe. There is another question about absorption. So if we take iron, so heme iron is obviously the you know, superior one from animal based sources. But if you're a vegan, why should you take fermented beetroot juice? in comparison to regular beetroot veggie juice. I actually did a little bit of uh, background research for you. Um, okay, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't answer that. Yeah, I can answer that. So <laughs> uh, fermented beetroot juice, it improves iron absorption uh, because it has um, this inhibitory, like, like there is certain inhibitory compounds often in, let's say, beetroot juice on any kind of plant source of iron. And when you ferment it, you're actually reducing some of the inhibitory compounds that might result in reduced iron absorption. Additionally, the fermentation may promote the production of certain organic acids and enzymes that can further enhance iron absorption and chelation of iron as well, mm -hmm. making it more bioavailable to uptake. But definitely heme iron is like the, the, the best source, uh, but the non-heme iron can definitely be improved through fermentation. Very interesting question. Mm. Yeah. Um, Actually, fermentation is the only way how to also increase the nutrient content of, of just about anything. You you often get, for example, B vitamins in, in fermented byproduct. Yeah, and like vitamin K2, good example, like in natto, tempeh, you know, like sauerkraut. So it's uh, hard cheeses, there's some fermentation going on. And uh, the problem 
for for those who have histamine intolerance is, is that uh, you probably won't tolerate those so that's also what i what i mentioned in in the presentation so it's it this is always a, like an individual thing to so you have to know your system you have to know your body yeah okay let's take a couple of conditions like people are often interested in in things like let's take the common one with vitamin c and kidney stones what's the link suan is asking yeah you can take like excessive amounts like um, basically anything if you take like a I don't know grams and grams like for a long time that's uh, may, maybe like uh, predisposing to kidney like stones and at the same time if you have a lot of oxalates you take a lot of oxalates from different kind of food sources definitely a problem so th- these two together like uh, might cause some problem but kidney is very effective also like removing these so it's uh like in moderation, and if you go for hydrosis in calcium, uh, I mean like vitamin C, just uh, go for a short period of time. Jennifer is asking if in the course we go over diets for people with high histamine. For hi- for histamine, I would recommend you to do some kind of nutrigenomics test so that you actually mm-hmm. understand your histamine situation, and then maybe even like avoiding some of the foods in a typical Mediterranean diet, like. Uh, salami or red wine or, or uh, tomatoes, which are high histamine foods, might be a good idea. Actually, dry, dry aged meats, yeah. also. Uh, to, yeah, uh, actually, I would recommend the Optimize Your Gut course because uh, in uh, week six or seven, in there I go through the histamine intolerance and kind of like how you can tune up, tune in your diet, which kind of probiotics you should and should not use. So the optimizer gut actually it's better for this one. So this course, the optimizer nutrition, this is more about building a nutrient dense diet for yourself uh, based yeah. on different kind of nutrients. Anele asks about oxalates and lectins. Basically the same thing. The gut course is amazing source. Yeah, gut course for that. And uh, about oxalates, I know it's a huge trend, and I've been like thinking about maybe writing an article about it, but. Uh, yeah, it's it's waiting for the future. Yeah, I think it's a bit reductionist. Uh, like yeah, there's people like, on the internet who says yeah. that all like not like these so-called we'll nutrients are bad, but actually there is like saponins that are extremely beneficial for health. So I think it's a little bit like, um, yeah, I mean black and white thinking to some extent when it comes to these so-called anti-nutrients. Yeah. Anti-nutrient al- almost sounds like it's bad for you. But even the nutrients that are blocking the absorption of some things, they have like other benefits. So, so mm. it's not that easy to like jump into conclusions about this, but definitely avoiding oxalates or lectins might be a good idea to a certain extent. Now, you, know what? you should avoid everything. Yeah, basically. Fast, you your, eat, fast your whole don't life. Eat. Don't Oxygen eat anything. Kills. Oxidative a breath- kills. <laughs> Breatharian, <laughs> because uh, meat will kill you. Like you will get definitely uh, too much of carnitine, which causes high TMO, TMAO, and uh, plants. All plants are gonna kill you. They have toxins. <laughs> you know, if you follow any of these kind of trends, you you become like, oh. Yeah, you can okay. find always something that kills you in the end. But hey, okay, you cannot so breathe because it's full of different kind of chemicals. One of the biggest killers is heart attack. So Ivan is asking, uh, basically, a pretty typical question. So. A dietitian recommended eating low fat protein and dairy. What is your opinion on this? Well, yeah, uh, I think we have covered this in the handbook even. So um, you need healthy, healthy fats. That's also kind of like what what, what are healthy fats. But uh, yeah, in the week um, four in the course, we go through different kind of fatty acids. You definitely need fat. How much? It depends. But uh, you need essential fatty acids. You you would want to go pretty high in monounsaturated fatty acids, which have been shown to be actually cardioprotective, especially olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, and so on. But but this is kind of like Dean Ornish, low fat, um, moderate protein, it's 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 not gonna go, not gonna take you anywhere. There's so much to it, like uh, reducing silent inflammation, number one, reducing chronic oxidative stress, number two, improving your insulin sensitivity in number three so if you nail these three things then like you're um, in safe waters i would say indeed so like let's throw in a couple of discounts right now so the top nutrition code on bikercenter.com you get 10 percent discount on 
not just the courses and books and all that that Oli mentioned, but we also have a good selection of curated supplements for you. If you want, for example, a really high quality iron supplement, there is one that has sting nettles and it has iron glycinate and like there, there is some really good stuff on the website. Uh, check it out. We only select and sell the highest quality supplements um, that we use ourselves. Now, when it comes to testing, uh, the test that we recommend today is the uh, Nordic Laboratories Metabolomics test. So we have a slide about that as well. So maybe only if you can like briefly like explain uh, why this is a really cool test. Yeah, I actually explained it in the beginning a little bit, but uh, as a reminder, this is not uh, measuring nutrient levels in the blood per se, but it's actually measuring based on these organic acids in the urine, your functional need for different kind of nutrients like vitamins, uh, microminerals and so on. But in addition to that, also metabolic markers for neurotransmitters like your um, energy production, the citric acid cycle, all kinds of uh, gut markers, and it, it's it's like a very comprehensive test. So that's why it's called metabolo metabolomics, and not just like nutrient test. So uh, you will get like this functional evaluation on the status of your body at this present like time. What do you actually need, and how mm -hmm. much? So it's it's really interesting. Like you have there here, <laughs> like recommendations. You have like let's say take. Uh, 100 milligrams of alpha lipoic acid and you take 3000 IUs of vitamin A and, and so on, so on. So you, you will get this report that's based on your results, your urine organic acid results. And you can tune in like uh, what do you actually need and how much. So I, I, in this sense, I just think this is like yeah. very genius. Someone asked also about DNA test. They've done a DNA test and basically, uh, does this add anything new? Yes, of course. Like, the, yeah. like basically, when you do any kind of laboratory or uh, blood work, a hair test, uh, organic acid test, you get like the current situation. And with genetics, you can then understand your uh, strengths and handicaps. So, if you have potentially, let's say, deficiency, you can then link that maybe back to uh, something going on with your genes. So, you maybe have to supplement or change the way how you absorb certain nutrients. So. That's a really good like combination. Uh, there's a question about from Jennifer about tests for gut permeability. And for that, we have doctor's data GI360. You do it three times and you get a very good understanding of your gut, your gut bacteria, uh, the microbiome, mm. and like many different markers related to gut. And if you need help with this, Oli is also available for online consultations. So you can you can actually buy any of these tests uh, and combine that with one-on-one uh, -on -one consultation from him. Yeah, person. indeed. Um, just, to, I think she asked about the gut permeability per se. So um, GI 360 might give a hint about it. Uh, otherwise, it's like like the Ferrari or Lamborghini of, of gut tests, like basically telling you everything. But uh, you would want to take this specific test for uh, the gut permeability. But uh, you can actually get that as an add-on. So maybe you just ask from our customer service. We can easily get that also for you. And uh, this is a good reminder for us to actually add it, add, add this test into our store. So it, it's something like people are really, um, they really suffer about that. If you have permeable, permeable gut, you probably have, have like a, this leaky brain also in the gut, uh, bl blood brain barrier. <laughs> a lot of different uh, words here. So um, there is a test uh, for that as well. Hmm, interesting. Uh, there's also someone is asking about like specific supplements like uh, Tongat Ali or Ashwagandha, but maybe this is not the right place for it. Yeah. But um, with many of these things like cycle then in, then in, uh, in and out, these are powerful substances. Even Ashwagandha, uh, even though it reduces uh, morning cortisol, for example, um, there is actually some studies i remember reading recently that on a regular use it can actually have like mood uh, effects that are not so positive in long-term use basically over consumption or improper use in excess amounts it can mm. uh, it can it's it kind of has like similar effects like serotonin reuptake inhibitors actually which is kind of interesting um 
And as, yeah, that that depends on the form of Af- Ashuganda and uh, like the concentration of like these withanoids and withanolites and different kind of compounds. So uh, this might be true, let's say, for KSM-66 and uh, even for central oil, but I haven't seen uh, anything like this for uh, this Shoden ashwagandha, which is like this micro-encapsulated form. So this is more of the HPAX regulation and, and the hormonal side. But as with any adaptogen, taking breaks every now and then would be like recommended. So... Um, that's also a good reminder for me because I, I'm like, oh, yeah, let's, let's pop this ashwagandha, let's have some reishi. But um, every now and then, you know, when the bottle ends or whatever the form, just have a break. And then um, if you feel like it, you're going to higher stress state, then maybe introduce it back again. Mm. Yeah, like, for example, one thing that is very popular is lion's mane. And uh, even though, yeah, great, you get some, you know, neural growth factors and it's all that the long, long longevity forums is full of people uh, reporting like lower libido for example like in extended periods of use so it's and important those. to cycle these things in and out like mm-hmm. they like that's anecdotal but like if that's true like it's easily mitigated by cycling things in and out so um, yeah don't you do the same thing every single day thinking that it won't have consequences so um the same for food you know it, you know this nutrition course if you eat the same foods every single day you will probably get intolerant to those so cycling proteins especially is a very good idea like do not eat like the same food all the time yeah all right so um i think we can almost continue with the rest of the presentation but maybe still from lucia about heavy metals like uh, what would you do for heavy metal testing probably a lot of people are concerned about Mm. heavy metals in their cacao or whatever like that's those are the kind of nutrients you don't want to have too much right yeah definitely test for those like blood test that's that's uh, needed a blood spot test might be useful i think uh, we might have an add-on for the metabolomics test as well i definitely have taken like those like maybe 10 years ago and then as a follow-up i used to have a little bit of too much of uh, i think it was Aluminium, aluminium and also maybe a little bit of lead and like detoxing these uh, was really helpful uh, because they were like hindering the cytokine uh, acid cycle like which means energy production so uh, but there's a hint uh, about these like um, you have these like inhibitors if you have like the citric acid cycle there are things that improve like the converse, conversion from this step to this step like let's say from oxalate to acetylcoenzyme A and so on. And um, heavy metals, they are kind of interrupting these uh, steps here and there. So testing for these um, would be also recommended. But there's there's a recommendation if it, this test says, hey, consider this, I like taking this uh, toxic heavy metals panel. So, yeah, yeah, there's actually yeah. amazing advice on the chat. Play heavy metal to test your color <laughs> for heavy metals. Okay. <laughs> That's all you need. (laughs) Shall we finish the presentation? No, I'm just going to play heavy metal. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. They're from Finland. Like the Nordic black metal is like pretty hard stuff. I don't like that. I'm more of a like trans trans guy. Me too. Trans. No, not that trans, but trans trans music. Presentation about nutrition. All right, halfway through. <laughs> I don't know. We are oh, we are over 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 an hour in. So uh, yeah, hopefully, go. hopefully you have a lot of time. So yeah, continuing. Now let's uh, continue with the presentation, and we move to fatty acids, uh, which is uh, the week four of the Optimized Nutrition online course. And uh, let's go through the basic. Uh, Fat and fatty acids, 101 key takeaways. So it is very important source for energy for everybody. Like uh, that's why ketogenic diets work so well when your metabolism is attuned with burning fat for energy. It is really effective and you have it stored. You can get it uh, from food easily. And of course, they are needed for the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins and carotenoids, which are fat-soluble as well. 
and about the composition it's mainly composed of triglycerides almost like uh, 98% and uh, a triglyceride molecule consists of one glycerol like at the backbone and three fatty acids and there are different like forms of uh, fatty acids and um, that's uh, what we cover in the course uh, as a total and uh, of course there are different like phospholipids and sterols which um, function in the cell walls and so on. And uh, dietary fats, such as triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols, they are used in the body as like uh, they are hydrolyzed to fatty acids um, by digestive enzymes produced by pancreas, and they are absorbed in the small intestine. And bile is definitely needed that uh, the, the uh, liver produces bile and it's stored in the gallbladder, and it's like making these emulsified fat droplets, which are then like uh, uh, from the intestines, they are absorbed like as these mysoles, and then from there on uh, to to the like small intestine. Yeah, but this is like um, I'm not gonna spend any more time uh, like explaining about this basic biochemistry about fatty acids. But there are certain like things that are very interesting and in the course I will go like systematically through every possible fatty acid <laughs> available and uh, needed for the human body. And uh, as a basic things, um, the fatty acids can be like divided into short chain fatty acids which have like uh, under six carbons. They are produced by the gut in, in the good bac bacteria produce these. And they usually like feed the cells in the colon, but also they might feed the liver and the kidneys. Uh, we have like butyrate, acetic acid, propionate, and so on. Then we have like MCTs, which are 6 to 12 carbons. They're usually found in coconut oil or coconut and palm oil. And uh, these are very effectively converted into ketones. So that's why people use these medium chain triglycerides to give, give immediate energy. And then we have long chain fatty acids, and uh, it's there are like 13 to 20, 21 carbon atoms, and um, yeah, they they can be again uh, divided into like this uh, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids, and um, different kind of effects, uh, and found in different sources of foods, and um, yeah, how to make this uh, as simple as possible because this could be like very complicated. Uh, what does a saturation mean? Uh, the saturation degree of fatty acid it depends on the possible double bonds between the carbon chains. So they can be either saturated, monounsaturated or polyunsaturated. So they have uh, like one, two or three or more of these uh, double chains. And if the fat is saturated, it's very stable it's not easily like broken down. It 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 uh, tolerates heat very mo very like easily, and that's why it's very good for like frying food. Uh, fatty acids they, they can be also classified as essential and non-essential fatty acids. They affect in cell signaling the body and alter gene expression in fat and carbohydrate metabolism. So they're like also functioning as this signaling molecules in the body. And uh, now a little bit more jargon. They may act as ligands for the perxosome proliferation activity receptors, PPRs, which play an important role in the regulation of inflammation. And uh, the things in the fatty acid that affect these are eicosanoids. Also fat formation, you don't want that too much, adipogenesis, but also insulin and other neurological functions. So. Fatty acids, they have a wide variety of function in the body and depending on their like structure, they have a different function. Uh, there are certain essential fatty acids and from these, basically all other fatty acids can be made, but it's not that effective. But these need to be obtained from the dietary sources. So if you take a look at the slide, uh, these two are the short chain fatty acid. Uh, it's an omega 3 one. It's called alpha linoleic acid or ALA. And the, the, this would actually say long chain 
omega-6 fatty acids, it's called linoleic acid or LA. And that's something people usually get a lot from the diet. And the bad thing is that people get it way too much. And it might cause a lot of problems like uh, chronic inflammation in the system. Uh, the human body can produce other fatty acids uh, from these essential fatty acids, as you can see from here, <laughs> this uh, image on the right side. Uh, but that, that's not optimal for like, um, like optimal attrition. Like here is the, the synthesis pathway of polyunsaturated omega-3 fatty acids. But the conversion ratio, let's say from ALA to EPA and DHA, it's only about 1 to 30. So you might get deceived that, hey, this is high in omega-3s, when it actually is high in ALAs, and it, it, it has almost nothing to do with EPA and DHA. So that, that is a kind of like a deceiving problem that you might be, you're not actually, hey, okay, this is omega-3s, but hey, the wrong ones. Yeah, and the linoleic acid, people usually get that too much, and um, eventually it's, it's kind of like a different um, synthesis pathway, and uh, different fatty acids are being produced from that. But why EPA and DHA are so important are their production, or they are further uh, transformed into these kind of resolvins, protectins, and neuroprotectin D1, so they lower inflammation, they lower the risk for cardiovascular disease, so that's why there's so much hype about fish oil, omega-3s, and that's why it's, it's kind of like a wild west in the supplements and supplementing side, and uh, there's all kinds of um, omega-3 supplements. You actually might not, not get any benefit if they're oxidized, you might get more harm from taking those, so um, in that sense, uh, concentrating on the high quality if you are going to supplement with fish oil or like this cod liver oil go for very 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 high quality uh, that is not being oxidized at all um, again i'm not going to go through all of these fatty acids but i would like to highlight monounsaturated fatty acids so here are like the key takeaways takeaways takeaway let's have a takeaway <laughs> The most important ones are palmitoleic acid, it has 16 carbons, oleic acid, 18 carbons, and this uh, thing called kisvaxenic acid, which has 17 carbons. And around 90% of the oleic acid is present in dietary sources. So that is the most important monounsaturated fatty acid. Remember this, oleic acid. And as I measured like these fatty acid profiles from let's say maybe like hundreds, hundreds of people, and usually people do not get enough of oleic acid. And the extra virgin olive oil is absolutely the best source for this. And the oleic acid, it's also acting as a building block of cell membranes, especially in the myelin sheets of nerves. And uh, they, they seem to improve also the blood cholesterol levels and possibly even prevent the development of coronary heart disease. So that's why it, it is so important. And uh, um, I've seen a couple of research papers about the specific effects of extra virgin olive oil uh, regarding the uh, Mediterranean diet. And it seems that it is the single most important factor in the diet when you think about uh, preventing cardiovascular disease. So that is the reason I'm highlighting it here. So for many it's beneficial to increase the intake of monounsaturated fatty acids and at the same time to reduce the intake of saturated fatty acids and carbohydrates. I'm not saying you shouldn't eat any saturated fats because that's definitely not the case. Uh, I eat that also quite a bit but I, I'm definitely like increased when I've um, gone through this literature years ago my olive oil intake and reduced a little bit of the saturated fat intake so that seems to be good at least for my genetics so you can actually have uh, of a gene test recommendations uh, based on that and um, now actually it seems um, I need a power source for my laptop otherwise uh, we are not <laughs> gonna go 
<laughs> through this presentation. So this is all, something. All is going to run out of power. I'm running out of power. I need some battery or Red Bull energy drink. <laughs> yeah, let's bring on some questions. So if anyone has questions, like please, please yeah. ask. Have a question chat. break here um, until we find. Yeah, this is something I totally forgot. Like, yeah, need some so power. Anyway, um, there has been some. Not, not a lot of new questions here, so let me pick up something that was previously uh, brought up. Um, where did I put it? Here we go. So what about hair testing? So test mm. done for hair versus urine versus like, what would you test on a hair? Yeah, it's, it's good for certain uh, minerals and nutrients and not so good for something uh, <laughs> else. If you really want to find out like the nutritional need or like the the uh, the levels then i would i would not only take like her mineral elements but it's good um for certain like heavy metals even and um i, I would just have to check uh, i used to also do that people like to like hey we we cut some hair and then then analyze what's in there it might show let's say like if you're deficient in zinc or something that's uh um, you can see from the hair tissue itself, but as a single uh, and only uh, way of measuring nutritional status, it's uh, not enough. What would you look in like full blood? All of it. <laughs> full blood versus intracellular. Is there like some minerals that you would like? Yeah, for? basically you want to aim for um, like the red blood cell levels like um, it's erythrocyte for different uh, nutrients or the whole blood. If you just measure from serum, it's not going to give you the whole story. Let's say like in terms of magnesium, it's it's not going to reveal you 98% of the actual levels that are in the blood cells, like red blood cells. So you want to aim for erythrocyte, it's usually like E magnesium or whole blood, which is usually like B magnesium so that's but this is also covered in the course in in a lot of detail and uh, yeah you want to measure it from the whole blood or erythrocyte now we have power back and uh, i think we can like continue with the rest of the presentation yeah let's go i Someone was uh, asking about fatty acids and check out the biohack.to slash biostarks for an upcoming test which is very comprehensive on fatty acids as well but anyway only feel free to continue yeah there's an add-on test actually it, it might be even included in the metabolomics test i think it's it's uh, including fatty acids yeah but i was speaking about monounsaturated fats and uh, especially extra virgin olive oil or evoo like uh, these kind of abbreviations they are all over the place it lowers silent inflammation like that's the number key killer uh, regarding cardiovascular disease, elevated silent inflammation has multiple benefits in the brain as well, cognitive, cognitive functions, and it's cardiovascular protective. And in the course, I have nitty gritty details in my lecture about different forms of olive oil. Why should you, why should, should you go like for unfiltered ones? For example, it has ten times the polyphenols that like the regular extra virgin olive oil has. So all these kind of uh, cool details and regarding antioxidants now we go into the part five antioxidants as the name says in they fight against oxidative stress in the body and this is what uh, we have in, uh, covered in the course like um, we don't have all of the antioxidants because it's it's a vast space of different kind of chemicals, but like the most important ones like carotenoids, we have coenzyme Q10, different phospholipids, choline, inositol, betaine, or like TMG, NAC, alpha lipoic acid, glutathione, taurine, curcumin, green tea, resveratrol, flavonoids, and polyphenols, and so on. And of course, the measurements, how you can actually measure if your body has oxidative stress that's a really good measurement to take and also uh, what is the plasma's antioxidant capacity in your body 
And yeah, here's a good quote. Uh, the main purpose of antioxidants when obtained from food is to balance oxidation reduction reactions at the cellular level and prevent excessive oxidative stress. We need oxidative stress in the body. If you're just like hammering down too much antioxidants, that's also a problem. But if you're not getting any of it, that's also a, a bigger problem. So antioxidants lower oxidative stress. Simple as that. And as you can uh, probably deduct from the image uh, behind this uh, statement, uh, the more color there is in your diet, the more natural antioxidants you will have. So, hey, what about carnivore diet? Yeah, I don't think that it's sustainable in the long term. You're probably gonna miss something. You're gonna miss at least the polyphenols, their effects on the body, their effects, beneficial effects on the microbiota of the gut, and so on, and so on, and so on. But in certain instances, like uh, let's say if an autoimmune disease, then going for the carnivore diet, it's uh, probably one of the most uh, fastest ways to, to heal. But um, this an autoimmune protocol I'm actually covering more in detail in the uh, Optimize Your Gut online course. Um, I picked up one antioxidant here uh, for this lecture, for the webinar, and that's glutathione which is the master antioxidant of the body. And it's consisting of like three amino acid acids. And the body is synthesizing glutathione from cysteine, glutamic acid, and glycine. And usually the ones that uh, we need the most are glycine and also some form of cysteine, let's say like in the form of an acetyl cysteine. And these two together are really powerful in uh, improving the glutathione levels in the body. But the glutathione, what, what the heck is that? It's a three peptide, like three amino acids in there. And it functions both as an oxidant like a, and also as a reducing agent. So it depends. It's kind of like mastering the redox uh, oxidation balance in the body. So in, in this way, we have these genius uh, mechanisms in the body that uh, always try to bring us into the homeostasis. But the glutathione levels, they may be, may be depleted or reduced if the oxidative stress in the human body is very high. And if the plasma's antioxidant capacity is greatly reduced. And um, if you have a decreased dietary intake of any of these amino acids, it can lead to the inadequate formation of glutathione. So, for example, I usually take in the evenings, I take maybe 7 grams of glycine and usually like 600 milligrams of N-acetylcysteine and it seems to really be like having good effect on sleep but also like recovery and uh, balancing uh, the antioxidant status in the system. How to increase glutathione? Uh, there are different um, things of course you could take glutathione like liposomal glutathione itself um, but I, I usually recommend that you go for the precursors, and as I've mentioned before, and still cysteine. Also, vitamin C improves that. Um, glutamine, taurine, uh, there's even curcumin, and, uh, you know, consumptive liver, and this uh, herb or called milk thistle, alpha lipoic acid, and so on. So, yeah, uh, my favorite ones of these are definitely n cysteine and glycine. So um, should you take like basic pill form glutathione? Uh, usually it's, it's not that effective. It might have some effects, but uh, definitely if you want to supplement with glutathione, go for the liposomal form. The other thing from the antioxidant side I want to go through is uh, the flavonoids and polyphenols. So these are these polyphenols are a large family of natural chemical substances, and they are in many many plants and berries. The more color there is, usually the more polyphenols there are. So they basically protect the plant from UV radiation, different kind of animals, microbial infections, and they promote the normal growth process. 
And the higher the bacterial diversity in the gut, the better the absorption of different flavonoids. But it goes the other way around as well. So flavonoids and polyphenols, they also enhance the gut microbiota. And, uh, but these um, should be ingested in very large quantities to have a significant impact at the cellular level. But if let's say if you eat like a lot of different colors and plants, in your diet, you're probably going to get a lot of these polyphenols and they have a lot of beneficial effects. And especially flavonoids, they have been shown to have significant anti-inflammatory effects in the body. And in the course material, we go through like all of these different forms like anthocyanins, flavonols, flavones, flavonols, flavonones, and isoflavonones, and what are the best sources and uh, where do you find, find these. So you can easily just... Uh, build a diet that's um, appropriate for your needs and uh, your lifestyle. This is a list of the best food sources for polyphenols. Uh, different kind of colorful berries are there, like choke berry, but we also have a, like raw cocoa powder. So raw chocolate, really good one. Rosehip, like blueberries, bilberries different kind of berries, cranberries, berries in general. And uh, of course we have, uh, let's, say, let's say like lentils, even legumes, uh, red cabbage, curly kale, and so on. All like of these comprehensive lists are found in the course. And yeah, coffee, it also has some polyphenols. So that's um, probably one of uh, behind the reasons of its health benefits. So it's, it's not uh, caffeine per se, which might have some benefits, but it, it usually is due to the coffee's polyphenols. Whew, let's have a breather and go to the last uh, part of this uh, webinar and lecture. And they are amino acids and carbohydrates. Amino acids and carbohydrates. So this is also the last part of the course. The key takeaways, um, what are amino acids? And why should you care about this? Uh, well, they are basically the building blocks of life for different kind of proteins. And um, they occur naturally in organic or carbon-containing compounds. Uh, this is a lot of jargon, so I'm just going to skip that. But basically, two, 20 amino acids are important for humans. And nine of them are essential. So they must be obtained from dietary sources. And uh, the remaining can... Uh, these 11 non-essential, they can be synthesized by the body. Well, but of course you can get these and you will get these also from the diet. And 20, these 20 amino acids, they are proteinogenic. So that means they are turned into proteins that are essential for the body. So they form proteins. So amino acids make up all the proteins needed in the body. And there's different kind of function for, for different um, systems, enzymes and so on. And non-proteinogenic amino acids, they act as brain neurotransmitters in the body and they are involved in the urea cycle. So they are also very important ones. And if you're going deficient in the proteins and especially amino acids, it can lead to actually various diseases. Now let's, um, yeah, here, here's this interesting slide about the exchange between tissue proteins and free amino acids. So you have this free amino acid pool, and uh, it's either ex like secreted, going to oxidation or non-protein pathways, or it's going to the tissues for building the tissue protein. But also the tissue protein, if you're like uh, severely like uh, starving yourself, you're calorie restricted, and you're not like uh, burning fat that much, but you you could also be burning tissue protein. And it's, it's, it's used for like um, energy in the body as well. So that's also kind of like a, this reserve mechanism. But you wouldn't want that, that you're actually burning your muscles for energy. So, yeah. And the protein could be lost via skin, hair, and also the feces. So this is kind of like a constant exchange of different uh, amino acids uh, and the pool. Yeah. But uh, my favorite one is and are, and they are essential. They are essential amino acids. And here's what I think personally. Uh, it's the Buddhist Finnish brand. It, it has this optimal EAA. 
and why it's optimal, it, it has this master amino acid pattern that's uh, absorbing at least 99% of that. So um, they actually contain eight of these nine essential amino acids because based on some studies, histidine can actually be made and the, ele the levels of histidine are elevated when you ingest these other eight essential amino acids. But they, f they are like uh, needed for different kind of functions in the body. Let's take like leucine, which is uh, the key uh, amino acid in muscle protein synthesis, growth and repair. But it's also elevating insulin levels in the body. It's, it's also activating this mTOR signaling in the body. Then we have like uh, isoleucine and uh, lysine. These are branch chain amino acids. And they are also these kind of like anabolic amino acid also taking part of uh, regulating blood sugar and energy production and lysine is for, for the collagen formation and so on. So these are these nine are needed for the body for different kind of functions. And um, let's say you are fasting or you are doing some kind of protein restriction, then supplementing with EAs, it's, it's very advisable. And if you train fasted, like I often do, then I usually supplement with EAs to support uh, the protein synthesis and also like the repairing of, of the damaged tissue, but also like neurotransmitter production. And if you compare BCAs to EAs, it's, a, it's been shown clearly that EAs are superior to BCAs in terms of like muscle building, but also other functions and BCAs might cause all kinds of problems. But that's also for the course. Um, why use this? What are other possible benefits? Well, uh, they improve appetite control. They improve cognitive function. They improve sleep quality and depth. Uh, depth. <laughs> depth. Depth. <laughs> you should definitely, by the way, check this comedian called Ismo. <laughs> he has like this really genius comedy about language itself. Uh, yes, for metabolic health, red blood cell production, blood sugar control, gl glycogen store replenishment, and also, like as, as I mentioned, muscle tissue maintenance, and especially if you're doing fasted workouts or you're in on a hypocaloric diet, you want to lose weight, so these EAs will definitely help you maintain muscle mass. So they clearly increase protein synthesis and nitrogen like balance. So this means better recovery. Yeah, best sources, basically all animal foods, but especially like game meat, like elk, bison, reindeer, so on. But yeah, different kind of animal proteins, fish, eggs. Then we have some like Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, and then uh, some vegetable or like vegetarian sources like lentils, beans, and uh, if you combine rice protein and pea protein, you get this um, perfect combination of different amino acids. And of course, whey protein, really good one for that. So that's, you know, that's it. We are true. It's <laughs> almost two hours. But that's if you want it. to learn more, what should you do? Indeed, you should definitely check out biohack.to slash optimize nutrition. That's the page where you can find more information about the Optimize Your Nutrition online course. You can also find there the nutrition guide as well. That is a really condensed over 200 page uh, guidebook, almost 300 actually, on optimizing your nutrition. And if you really want to be serious about this, you get some of the tests done so you understand where you are right now and then you start implementing straight away everything you learn from a book like this and as you dive deep into it you learn more about what you're actually eating on a daily basis for example Oli was talking about plant polyphenols personally i have this jar and it's it has about 20 different berry powders so this is like my approach my source of polyphenols in my diet so i'm not just thinking about like okay let's have some bilberries or lingonberries or whatever i just mix them up all in one powder mix and by the way i'm putting it in my co in my coffee so it's like it's sometimes it's in my morning coffee this thing so um why you should get on this course is because it's the most comprehensive one available on the market right now 
It is six weeks condensed information about fatty acids, minerals, and uh, vitamins, and uh, like all these like polyphenols and everything you want to know about nutrients, micronutrients specifically, and how to use that to optimize your diet. So whatever that diet is, a vegan diet, carnivore, omnivore, whatever keto you are doing, you will learn a ton from this guide. So you don't need to like go searching around and have all these questions in your mind. You get all of them here. And if you still have questions, Dr. Oli Soviarvi is on the platform ready to answer your questions. So what is a really nice combination is to get this course and the metabolomics test, and then you're in a good place to get started implementing these things in your daily life. And if you need direct advice from Dr. Oli Soviarvi, he also provides this preventive health consultation on bikercenter.com, where he can go through your particular lab tests and your particular questions and concerns. Note that it's not focused on uh, disease. So if you have a medical condition or something like this, you may want to you know, go through a traditional health practitioner on that. But if you're interested in longevity, if you're interested in optimizing your current nutritional status, all of that, that's probably the best place to start from. So check out biohack.to slash optimize nutrition and you find more information about the course and an overview of that one. And at this point, I thank you all for uh, being so active, uh, providing so many awesome questions. I think we covered a lot of ground and if you still need more, uh, check out the book and uh, most of the questions will be answered there. And Yurai is asking, will I get through course Optimal Nutrition, the same content what is on the electronic book? Uh, so only maybe you can answer that like uh, the course and the book. So the course is obviously a video course where you actually give mm. like hours and hours of presentation that goes into detail. But yes, it's based on the book. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The material, like the raw text material is totally based on the book. But what you are missing are these kind of exhaustive lectures. And of course, uh, usually there's a lot of conversation. So people ask questions, I answer them, and they're all available for everybody else to see there. So so in our fin Finnish um, versions of this course, there are like hundreds and hundreds of my answers eventually. Uh, so, so people will learn a lot about this. And of course, uh, you're not getting supplement recommendations in the guide. Uh, there's nothing about those. So that's also a quite quite a big thing. So you get like you get all the information, but from there on, what to do? You're not getting that uh, except in the course. Right. So see you on the course. We'll be happy to see you there. And if you also want to fix your gut, we also have the optimize your gut course. That is like hands down the most comprehensive source material online that you can find and it's the uncompromising bikers handbook book quality the way how we do everything is like we really go into the science we really science. go into references and science, we, science. All, we, all, we skip all the fads and we just go straight into the beef Hashtag or, science. or whatever you're having yeah <laughs> extra virgin olive oil science all Why right you put science. it into your coffee <laughs> yeah I, I put some EVO really good... into my mitochondria. Yeah, I actually made a coffee this morning with uh, NAD <laughs> and glycine and like I'm and fisatine actually as well. So I made mm. like a longevity coffee. It's uh, it works actually pretty well. Now you're All 120. Right. Yeah, and <laughs> and we also have a recording of our previous webinar on longevity. There were some questions about longevity and all that, so we have quite a lot of that answered in the previous webinar as well. So check it out and subscribe to the Parker's podcast. That is a source and wealth of information about how to optimize a healthy lifestyle. So check out biohackerspodcast.com. But with that, thank you very much only for this excellent comprehensive presentation and to all our, all our um, uh, listeners and see you in the next episode. Thank you, Tim, and uh, perhaps, or hopefully, see you in the course. And if not, uh, then 
enjoy your life and hopefully you got something uh, goodful or useful f- or out of this presentation and webinar for you. Yeah. Until stay, the next one. Stay neutral and dance. Stay optimized.